It's 4 o'clock on a Tuesday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! Hey, you guys, how are you? Good to see everybody. There I am. Okay, now that I know I'm on, great to see you guys. Today we are going to talk about why music libraries get half the money. Interesting. Uh, let me say hello to everybody in the chat room. We've got Peter Rahill, Dan Weber, Nancy Collell, Simon Burnham, Andre Stepanian, Ewart Williams, Chris Anderson. Did I say Simon Burnham? I did already. Uh, Lamar Pecorino, Bob Gunnerfelt, Marion Laird, Crash Gates, Greg Carosa, back for two days in a row. Great job yesterday, Greg. Really, really, really good job. Um, let's see. Ove, shy. How are you, Ove? Uh, Doreen Gibson. Okay, that's. I think I've covered everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, yeah, great show yesterday. Always a pleasure uh, to have Greg on the show. And uh, as I said at the start of yesterday's episode, his kind of before music, the bad stuff, was actually really good. Um, the good stuff was just exceptionally good and, and you know I mean, the earlier stuff sounded very professional but the screeners had some good points he took it to heart and the later stuff just like nailed it um so great job i got uh got some nice compliments uh in the comments section got a couple emails and uh, everybody seems to have liked the show a lot so thank you greg for taking the time to do that um, so I was looking at our forum earlier today. I'm actually having one of those days where I'm like falling asleep, sitting up at my desk. We had an earthquake yesterday morning. Today is Tuesday. So I think it was yesterday morning at 4.44 a.m. We had a 4.0, not that far from us. 4.0 doesn't make most California, unless you're new to California, you're like, oh, was that an earthquake? Um, it did wake me up. Uh, used to be in the early days when I moved here 30 some years ago, if we had a 4.0, man, I'd be out of that bed and hiding under the bed or, you know, in a door jam or something. And all that came in handy in uh, whatever year it was, 1994, when we had the Northridge quake, because that was just violent. That was literally, this is what the Northridge quake was like. <laughs> Guess what those are? Guess I just ate like 10 of those. Hopefully I will be waking up in the middle of the episode. Um, anyway, it was like being a BB in a, like one of those little plastic film canisters. It was just brutally violent. Um, so even when a 4.0 earthquake happens nowadays, you go, no, you can tell. Usually you can tell in the first two or three or four seconds if it's going to be, you know, like, that's it, that's as bad as it's going to get, or it's going to get much worse. Um, so you know whether to hop out of bed or not. Uh, Greg Carrozza has the exact chocolate-covered espresso beans. Just had a few about an hour ago. Uh, you know, I, I like the ones that come in a little package by the checkout stand because they've got some different flavors of chocolate wrapped around the bean. But these are certainly pretty wonderful. Uh, and they make really good <laughs> sound effects. <laughs> oh, man. So, all right. Topic number one today. Um, I saw somebody ask a question on the forum. Oh, my light's up there. It turned out no biggie. I look marvelous. Great lighting. Great green screen. I see a little... What's going on over there? Yeah, you know, it's getting really hard to pick my wardrobe for the show because so much of what I own has green in it. And uh, we all know what happens when whoa, I hold up anything green. <laughs> it's like, magically, we can see a recording console right through my shirt. Here, let's see one right through my head. Uh, <laughs> I am so easily entertained. You know, give me a green screen and anything, and I can just sit here and entertain myself all day long. Anyway, um, a bass shaker, there you go. <laughs> Might even be a contrabass. 
Um, okay, so Edo Sev posted on March 20th in the Taxi Forum, which if you've never been there, I cannot recommend it enough at forums with an S dot taxi dot com. Um, it's such an incredible resource. People who are using it regularly swear by it. Um, people who've been members in years past still hang out on the forum. People who are successful members hang out there and share what they know and how they became successful. Um, people who are new to Taxi really ramp up their education and the speed at, with which they become successful using Taxi because they hang out on the forum. So yeah, forums.taxi.com. I strongly recommend it. So Edo Sev or Edo Sev, E D O S E V, posted on March 20th, 2021 at 9.55 a.m. Oh, I think I have a rock star uh, chocolate covered coffee bean burp coming. <laughs> classy guy that I am. I'd like to understand more in deep. Um, I'm guessing he's not maybe from the U.S. or English is his first. Uh, more in depth. Why, or maybe he just has overeager spell check. Um, I'd like to understand more in depth why the libraries usually take 100% of the publisher's share. I mean, what is the economic sense behind this distinction? Writer slash publisher question mark. And what is the practical implication of the industry of music synchronization? Yeah, definitely not his first language. Okay. Sorry, I'm a really bit confused about this topic. It's starting to sound cute at this point. I hope somebody can help me, even with a really short answer, thanks in advance. Well, Ido, you've come to the right place. Because Telefunken... Uh, and frankly, I don't even know who Telefunken... I know I've seen stuff posted by Telefunken a million times, and I think I've met Telefunken at a road rally or exchanged emails or something. Can't remember who it is. But he writes, because they are a publisher. As a publisher, what slice of the pie would you want for organizing contracts and storing them on a database, organizing multiple versions of a track, checking all the audio, checking all the metadata, and not just checking it, but creating it in many cases, updating it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I mean, another category of metadata would be sounds like refs, um, keywords, not just, you know, the boring part of metadata. Cross-referencing the track with its contract and writer account, collating it uh, with other similar tracks to make an album. So in other words, if you had a, a dramedy piece uh, and you wanted to create a 20-track dramedy album as a new release, kind of a marketing promotional tool, you would have to find other dramedy tracks that it would work well in concert with. No pun intended. Um, organizing the artwork, making the track and the album available on the massive website and database server that you maintain, uh, registering all the tracks with both your own and often the artist's PRO number or PRO period, um, then approaching every possible hard-earned contact to attract them to buy it before you can make a cent from it. Then, if you're lucky, and they do, striking a contract with the client and possibly organizing and distributing the payment of any upfront fees to all artists, there are probably more parts of the process I've missed, but all the work might also be for nothing if the track never attracts anyone to use it. Personally, I'm happy to share half the value of my track with someone who's willing to do all that work on my behalf in return, give me the opportunity for my music to be placed on TV, and it could be anywhere in the entire planet. Realistically, there's no way that I'd be able to do all this by myself, and I'd rather spend my time and effort making music anyway. Short, a short answer, under most circumstances, you're the writer and keep 100% of the writer's share, whilst the publisher, whoever that might be, and it could be yourself, keeps 100% of the publisher's share. There are variations on the equation, but it mostly holds true for sync licensing. So Telefunken, if you're in the chat room by another name, thank you. You answered that really, really well. I don't think, you know, I, I see people on other websites, I've seen them on other forums, um, I've seen them on Facebook groups and stuff. People complaining about libraries get half the money. Check your ego at the door. They are your business partner. If you manufactured widgets, you still need somebody to market them, to take the orders, 
to process the payments, to do the distribution of the widgets, to do the customer service on the widgets, to do the quality control. No, oh, no, I guess if you're manufacturing, you do the quality control, but you get the idea. There are always many other components. You don't just make great music and put it out there. And all these people in film and TV land in Hollywood go, wow, I heard about this awesome new artist or this awesome new composer or singer songwriter making music. I'm going to track them down and write them a check. No, it takes a business partner for you. So there you go. I thought Telefunken did a great, great job of answering that. Let's see. Um, Casey Hurwitz added, uh, all good answers. Also, it's the publisher that markets your music through industry contacts, building those relationships, etc. It's a full-time job unto itself. Those of us who've had placements know that we could never have gotten them without a publisher, at least in 99% of the cases. There are a few taxi members who became publishers. They can tell you what it's like on the other side. They earn, 50, they earn their 50% of the pie easily. I've got to tell you, I've got several, maybe even many people uh, that are music library owners or in the music licensing business in various capacities. And some of them are actually close friends. They will all tell me, they have all told me that they spend a ridiculous amount of time on tagging and the accounting, that those two issues um, just suck a lot of their time. Now, obviously, if, if it's a you know, uh, non-exclusive libraries getting a lot of uh, reality show placements. There are no sync fees to distribute. The PROs are taking care of the money. It's, it's still all that other stuff, you know? You've got to listen to every track. Um, you've got to think, okay, what do we need? We need splits on this. We need alt mixes on this. Um, gosh, uh, we should probably master this one because it just sounds a little wimpy, so they may master it themselves or may send it out for mastering. Um, all the database entry stuff, just all, uh, all these little details that go into it. It's not just as easy as one person's music and it gets sent out to everybody in the industry and they all go, dude, I love that. I want to put it in my TV show. Here's a check. doesn't work like that at all. Uh Simon Burnham is asking, Greg Carroza, do you have to sign up to BMI if you have a forward? Um, Simon, I'd like to, Greg can certainly answer that, but I'd like to answer that from the taxi owner's perspective, if you will. Um, you should be affiliated with a PRO, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, whomever. Oops. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, you should be affiliated with a PRO as soon as you start pitching your music in earnest for film and TV. Um, you don't want to do it at the last minute. Just that simple. Um, you may actually blow a deal uh, if you don't have a PRO. Uh, if a library wants something of yours and they need to get it out the door in a hurry for a specific request and you're not affiliated with a PRO yet, you might not be able to get that all turned around quickly enough, um, although I think it goes faster these days. Um, <laughs> Martin Gravel says, yeah, they do the dull part. <laughs> Employees and payroll and taxes. Let's talk about taxes. Whoa, again, not endorsing a candidate, not or not candidate, not, I'm not talking about any specific politicians. I'm just talking about what people are saying uh, about where taxes are going in the United States in the next year or so. My guess is that the new tax stuff won't happen until after the 2022 elections and shortly thereafter, everybody's gonna go, holy crap. Um, there have been some leaks about what the taxes are gonna be and, and the media will tell you, oh, it's not gonna affect you if you make less than $400,000 a year and everybody goes, oh, well, I make less than 400 grand a year. I'm cool, wrong. Uh, you really need to start uh, studying up on this stuff because um, you are a small business. Um, once you get in, you know, start getting your music out there, and if you're generating tens of thousands of dollars a year, maybe even if you're really lucky, a hundred grand, two hundred grand a year, 
um, you're a small business and all of a sudden it's it's not just income i mean you think oh this is great i get to write off a piece of gear because now i'm a small business um things that you wouldn't even probably think about like uh long-term capital gains so let's say that over i think a capital gain is defined as anything that you've owned uh for more than a year um, like intellectual property like songs let's say you own your own catalog um and you sell it well the I could be wrong about this. Certainly not a financial advisor, nor am I an attorney, nor am I an accountant. Um, I'm none of that stuff. I'm just a guy who reads a lot of stuff. And I think we're at 22%, 20 or 22% capital gains. And they're actually discussing raising long-term capital gains up to, is it 33% or 39%? I don't know. All I know is when I added up all this stuff as a small business owner in the state of California, which does tax you like 10% additionally above the federal stuff on your um, income. Plus, when you make above a certain level, which I think is 150k a year, you pay another 3% for some cockamamie tax that nobody's ever heard of, and you combine that with the federal stuff. Anyway, if all this stuff happens, I calculated if it happens that I would be netting about 40 cents on every dollar after 2022, if it all gets passed. So pay attention to the tax situation, people. And they tax you, you know, you get affected in other ways, like gas taxes, both federal and state. Um, there's some discussion of a wealth tax, not just like an income tax if you make over X amount of dollars per year, but an ongoing annualized tax on what you already have. So let's say, and I'm again, I'm just remembering what I've read and a lot of this stuff is probably opinion or prediction. I'm just regurgitating it, but something about a tax where let's say you've got a half a million dollars worth of stuff, whether it be stocks or real estate or whatever that you would pay a tax on that every year. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if you do that long enough, pretty soon you've got no value left because you've paid out in taxes what it was worth to begin with. I don't know. All I'm saying, not an expert, but you need to start paying attention to this stuff. Um, so there you go. Uh, got that covered. Oh, I made some notes somewhere about other stuff I wanted to talk about today. Taxes wasn't on the list, but starting to get a little scary around here um who reads magazines i am curious um i was in angel's office yesterday day before whatever last week and i saw a copy of music connection sitting uh on her desk oh look at that it's the see-through version of music connection um and i picked it up brought it down to my office and while i was struggling to stay awake about an hour ago i picked it up started thumbing through and thought to myself Gee, I wonder if anybody still reads magazines. I do. Uh, I happen to like magazines. Uh, do I do a lot of bathroom reading? Yeah, I do. Um, and so as I was reading Music Connection, which is a good magazine, if you're in the music industry, you should read Music Connection. Um, and I saw this device, which I've never seen before. There you go. It's a combination of the fader port and the um, PreSonus interface. And it's called the IO Station 24C. Uh, so I'm thinking that's kind of cool if the interface sounds good. Um, fader port is pretty darn popular. Um, so I'm thinking that might be interesting. I have to check that out. I want to wait until they come out with 24 fader. Well, they do have 24 faders. If um, I forget what it's called, but basically fader port times 24. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, if they just had an add-on module where you could add the pre or the interface, that would be kind of cool. I would like that. I would buy one. Uh, let's see what we got there. Uh, Cass McKenty says, MAGA zine. <laughs> Very good, Cass. Uh, Chris Anderson reads magazines. Jim Stamper, Dave Barnett. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Michael, buy a Tascam Model 12. What is a Tascam Model 12? Marion reads all of them. The Tascam HDDA pre's are killer. Interesting. Good to know. Damn, I used to have a friend that was CEO of Tascam. And he's always saying, is there anything we make that you want? At the time, there wasn't. But now, I wish he was still there. One more tax write-off. Gear, yes. Ken Mesford, all I read is magazines. Ian has not read a magazine in a very long time. Save your money, learn the trackball. <laughs> Heidi Owen reads the NRA magazine. Interesting. I don't even think you can say that publicly without getting canceled anymore. But not here because we don't discuss politics. Uh, we just discuss how the media sucks. Uh, the pessimist old man of me says, but what if the fader breaks? You're stuck with an interface that sounds killer with a broken fader. But maybe you could use the, the interface without having to use the fader. You are a pessimistic old fartlet brand. <laughs> uh, Riley Bear reads Mad Magazine, still a classic. There's somebody on TV that I see every now and then that's like, I can't remember who it is, an actor in a show or something, and he looks like Alfred E. Newman all grown up. Keith's wife says to me, are you doing your taxes in the bathroom or what? <laughs> I love magazines. <laughs> yeah, what do you read? CPA Monthly in there? Yeah, taxi, uh, again, not, you know, not accounting advice because I'm not an accountant. I don't even try to pretend I'm one on my TV show. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, you can write off taxi, I believe. I know that some people do, and I don't think they're breaking any laws, but I could be wrong. Used to subscribe to Keyboard Magazine. You know, I've never gotten tape up. I've looked at issues, um, and I remember liking it. And I think I just actually sent away for the media kit, meaning how much you pay to advertise and tape op. And I got it recently, but haven't looked at it. Uh, what are you sorry for, Simon? <laughs> what, me worry? Absolutely. I love Alfred E. Newman. He was my hero for many, many years. Could you imagine like Bart Simpson, Alfred E. Newman, and... Um, uh, who's the kid from South Park? The chubby little dude. Uh, I can't think of his name, but, you know, that guy. The three of them doing a road trip together. Are you guys hiring? Um, if you're talking about taxi, I don't think so at the moment. Uh, I think we just added another screen or two. Uh Fred Astaire did a dance in an Alfred E. Newman mask? Wow. Chris, you're a retired CPA? My actual CPA is in the same office complex as the taxi headquarters. Um, I met this guy in the parking lot like 15 years ago, and I used to joke, and he does not have the kind of personality that responds well to jokes, apparently, because I'd say... I'd see him, he looks to be roughly my age, and you know, I'd be walking out of the office like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and the only other person in the parking lot downstairs was this guy, and I said, what do you do? Why are you here so much? He goes, oh, I'm an accountant. And I said, yeah, but it's not even taxis. And he goes, yeah, I like to work. I swear, I'm here most Saturdays, he's here. If I come in and work on a Sunday, 
he's here. If I leave at 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday, he's here. He's actually, we just hired him as our accountant about, I don't know, three months ago or something. Um, and one of the reasons I hired him is I've never seen anybody work so much. I jokingly said to him one day, things must be not that good at home with your wife or something. He goes, no, everything's fine. He goes, I just have a lot of work and I enjoy what I do. Uh-huh. No, actually, Cartman, thank you. Um, yeah, he's a great guy and uh, obviously a hardworking guy. And I've got to say, so far, so good. He's been, uh, he's the kind of my last accountant was an expensive accountant that basically was just a tax preparer uh, more than anything. This new guy actually will call me. He will initiate calls to me and say, by the way, did you think about this? Have you done that? Have you noticed that you've got this and you could be doing it that way? It's wow. Um, yeah, there's actually a CPA not only in our complex, but in our building, like 100 feet away from me downstairs, we're on the second floor. Um, and uh, who's the guy that wrote futurehit.dna? Um, can't think of his name right now, but he was here for Taxi TV once. And when we left, he said, oh, I've got to drop something. And he's from Nashville, I think. And he said, I got to drop something off at my accountant's office. And he went downstairs and his accountant was in our building. He's just playing Fortnite. Uh, actually, it's funny, the accountant that's always here, he leaves his blinds open. So when I leave here at night and I see him, uh, now I can see him at his desk because he's very close to the exit of the complex. Uh, and he's not playing Fortnite. He's looking at spreadsheets. Boring. It's my least favorite part about being a business owner is looking at financials. Tika Epps, hello. I'm a new taxi member. <clears throat> well, hello. Welcome to our uh, dysfunctional family. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Um, also, former tax specialist for H&R Block. Yes, you can write off taxi as a business expense. Yay! Can you write it off even if you never make any money? That's the question. Um, I was once told by somebody that maybe you can write off some startup expenses in the first year of a business, but if you keep writing off expenses against a business that never earns any income, let alone a profit, um, that that's a no-no. Decounting things is a cover, that's right. It's like uh, Gus in Breaking Bad, the guy who worked at uh, Los Polos Hermanos, the Chicken Brothers restaurant, right? And he was actually like, the southwestern state's biggest uh, drug kingpin distribu distributor. No wonder their chicken flew off the shelf. It was high on methamphetamines. I've got to ask, Tika, is your spouse named Masala? <laughs> I am the... I can't tell a joke and I can't even make a joke. Quarantini Happy Hour TV, the meetup for dysfunctional musicians. Well, that would mean everybody is eligible, right? It was that Ralph Murphy used to always talk about how dysfunctional musicians are, like as their own tribe or their own race of people uh it, it's true even like the most together musicians i know have some sort of dysfunctional aspect i think it, it's part of being creative if you're functional it's hard to be creative maybe Ooh, lou brand uh, yeah deb and i just finished breaking bad about two weeks ago we binged all 72 hours inside of about three weeks, I think. Um, she wouldn't watch it for years. She goes, I don't want to watch a show about drug dealers. <laughs> if my wife is watching today, I'm not getting any dinner tonight. <laughs> anyway, she had no desire to watch the show. And finally, one night I said, come on, just try, you know, one or two episodes. If you don't like it, we don't have to watch it. 
And she ended up watching it. And, and we would watch like three or four episodes a night. It became a, a true addiction. So good. They're the best cliffhangers. You can't get to the end of an episode and not watch the next one. Um, and then Better Call Saul. We took a couple nights off and uh, jumped into Better Call Saul. It, it's the same, but different. Um, I hope you would agree, Keith. You live in Albuquerque and never watch Breaking Bad Carosa. Get a life, dude. Um, you definitely need to watch it because it, it's pretty Albuquerque-centric. Uh, are you talking to me? Where am I in California? Because if you are, we are in beautiful Calabasas, California, home of the lovely Kardashian family. Yep, a lot of three. Oh, yeah, Deb and I, it's like at two o'clock in a show, in an episode ends, we look at each other and go, oh, what the hell, tomorrow's Sunday. <laughs> we'll stay up and watch one until three in the morning. We've only done three in the morning a couple times, but uh, man, oh, man. Uh, the, the writing is so strong. The character development is so strong. The acting is incredible. It just every episode you sit there, and, and, it, and you know what's interesting? It's not just the lead actors that are so amazing. It's like everybody, down to people that are just like, you know, almost like a bit player on this one episode. They're still quite amazing. You're re-watching The Muppet Show on Disney? Up until now, I had such respect for you, Greg. <laughs> Can I get Saul on the show to talk about copyright? The Wire on HBO. Absolutely. Um, you know what? When we get off the episode, Google, uh, who's the guy who plays Jesse in the show? Google his name and Architectural Digest and watch the videos of the house that he lives in in Idaho. It's like my dream house. And the music, incredible. Okay, so did I have other stuff to talk about? Uh, oh yeah, uh, so I talked about the pre thing. I'm curious because uh, vaccination um, <laughs> seems to be the buzzword of the month, a and the, the phrase that goes along with it is um, Pfizer or Moderna. <laughs> I've had one shot. I get my second one Friday of this week, actually. Um, and my wife is getting the J&J &J single shot Thursday, I think. Um, Anyway, uh, it, it's so funny now. It's like every time you talk to a friend or an acquaintance, did you get vaxxed yet? Well, yeah, I did. I've had my first one. M Moderna or Pfizer? <laughs> it's like, does anybody really know the difference? Really? Um, and I've got to say, there is, my own personal observation is that there is an air of normalcy is on the horizon. Uh, Deb and I went out for sushi last night at our favorite little neighborhood restaurant. Been going there for like 20 years and uh, really missed it during the lockdown. And it's actually open inside and out now. We haven't gone inside yet, but it's a, a small restaurant. I mean, it's only got probably enough seats for 20 people on the inside. And that looked to be around half full last night. And then outside, they took a chunk of parking lot, you know, uh, which always scares me a little bit when you're eating in a parking lot. You know, all it takes is a 16-year-old that doesn't remember to look in their rear view or over their shoulder when they back up, and your dinner comes to a crashing end. But um, it just, I saw more people, I, I'm a little amazed when I see people driving a car with their windows up and they're wearing a mask. Um, I'm, I'm not making fun of them. Everybody's entitled to feel how they feel. 
but I don't think anybody has ever thought that you could get corona driving in a car. Maybe they just forgot to take it off. Maybe I'm being overly judgmental. Maybe they just left a business and they needed the mask and they just forgot to take it off because they've become so used to wearing it. I don't know. But when I do see some, I saw somebody here in Calabasas yesterday on my way to work that was driving like a Rolls or a Bentley convertible, like the, the newest, latest, greatest, most expensive one, very, very fancy. And the gentleman behind the wheel was wearing a mask. And I thought, you're hermetically sealed inside of that thing. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, here's an actual question about taxi. Thank goodness for Marion keeping me on point, which is hard to do today because I'm so tired. I'm just like rambling. Uh, question, how soon after listing do the screeners go through all the submissions? Wondering if I can get feedback and or whether it was forwarded, thanks. Wondering when I can get feedback. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, w generally speaking, all these are generalities, but they're all truthful generalities. Uh, you're getting the inside dirt here, Marion. Um, Screening starts either the day of deadline or the day after deadline usually, sometimes a day or two before the deadline. And how we determine that is we actually know from a vast amount of experience, we can see the velocity of how things are coming in. And the a &R department checks that. Like when a listing goes out the first day it's out, and it gets 125 submissions on the first day, we immediately know that even though the deadline might not be for three weeks, that that's probably going to get up to four or 500 submissions. However, if uh, the listing generates 12 submissions on the first day, it's probably going to generate, you know, three, four hundred percent times that. So not that much. So they do um, a projection, basically. And they know when a listing is created, they know, okay, these three screeners have been checked out and are qualified to screen this genre of music. And I should further elaborate by saying that a screener who's great at R&B for records wouldn't necessarily and probably wouldn't be put on screening R&B for a music library because they're really kind of like oranges and tangerines. They're both the same color, but they're not the same thing. Somebody who understands R&B for a record may not really understand how R&B, what an, a good R&B song would be in the context of a TV show or a movie. So we take all those things into consideration. And a week before the deadline, um, uh, Eric from our A&R staff starts reaching out to screeners saying, I've got X, Y, and Z available for you next week. When are you available to work on it? Blah, blah, blah. So there are all these little kind of calculations and projections and things that are going on behind the scenes. All that to say that it's got to be a pretty big thing. Like if we were to run a listing for a $50,000 TV commercial that was singer songwriter we know we know as soon as we see that listing before we've even typed it up that one's going to generate somewhere between 350 and maybe as many as seven or eight or nine hundred submissions so in that case we might start screening a couple days early however to really answer the question you're asking nobody knows what the end results are for everything until they're all done. As I've said before in the show, I think there's something like 16 steps in, in the whole process from the first point of contact until the listing is done and out of here in the client's hands. Uh, and maybe the 16th or 17th step is we reach out to them. Did you get it okay? Um, any comments from you? Um, what else are you looking for is kind of the follow-up thing that usually happens a week or two after we sent them the material. So all that to say is there's no way to let you know until we've gone through the whole process. And part of the process is the fact that we do quality control on the work the screeners do. And so that adds a couple of days to the whole thing. We can't forward stuff and get back to you with critiques or feedback until the head screener has looked at all the stuff and made sure that it's all good. 
Um, otherwise, we'd be sending out less than A-level work, and we don't want to do that. So that does slow things down, but we bake that into the timeline cake, as it were. So I hope that answers your question, Marion. Let me scroll down. Ooh, man. Nancy's in trouble at home because you got a wedding invitation the week of the road rally, or the weekend of the road rally. Um, I have actually proposed to people who've worked here before that they should get married on stage in the grand ballroom at the road rally. Um, uh, if I knew your friends, Nancy, I might extend that invitation to them. Um, and Chris, I'll get remind me to answer your question in a minute. Uh, we had a woman that worked here a couple of years ago, um, and she got engaged, and she was trying to plan her wedding time around the road rally and I said why don't you just get married during the road rally we could do it like Sunday at the end of the road rally we could marry you on the stage you could invite a couple hundred people to sit in the ballroom and then you guys you know I'll give you the presidential suite uh, the that night Sunday night I'll just go home after the rally you can have the suite and uh, the next day jump on a plane at LAX and go on your honeymoon and then she ended up splitting up with the guy so they didn't take advantage of it. But I've offered that to a few people. All right, and Chris Anderson said, are submissions listened to on a first come, first serve basis? No, um, it's random, it's totally random. Um, uh, nothing I can really tell you about that other than let's say we get in 194 submissions for something. Um, it could be, if we got in, you know, like, 74 submissions we'd probably only put one screener on that um, because it's just not that much of a workload if we get a couple hundred or a few hundred there are probably going to be a couple of screeners that again are well qualified on that specific kind of thing um, and basically the the system just randomly reaches into the virtual bucket if you will pops one up on your screen and you go for it as a screener and if you let's say the screener sees something by Cass McKenty, and it's the third time he, he's seen this song from Cass McKenty inside of like a two or three or four week period, the screener can hit a skip button. So that throws it back in the bucket so somebody else can get it. If that screener is the only screener working on it and they've seen something so many times, they just feel like, I don't want that poor person to just keep getting feedback from one person. Um, they might let that they will let the head screener know or let eric know and if there's somebody else available they will have them screen it so the member gets the benefit of another opinion um i thought i saw one more question somewhere in there keith lebrant says by the way i was offered two deals from the stomp clap listing so far um oh you mean from oh from the stomp clap um uh what do you call it the stomp clap album that we put out or, or compilation that we sent out two new publishers i'd not worked with taxi rules well thank you for letting me know that um i really appreciate that as a matter of fact would you be kind enough to shoot me an email about that case so that i can include it in the that was my knee in there too uh, and the member deals thing that we're currently working on for the next taxi newsletter yeah we should have a wedding at the road rally you know my daughter Sarah and her husband um, Hayden met at a road rally about 10 years ago he was working at a booth for one of the sponsors <laughs> I remember uh, they say this didn't happen but I'm 100% absolutely certain they were falling in love so they can't remember anything um, but he walked up to me in the ballroom. I remember I was talking to Tina, our CFO at the time, Andrea Torsha, who was our head of A&R at the time, and one other person. And this young man from the sponsor booth walks up to me and he goes, who's that girl you were just talking to a few minutes ago? And I looked at him and I went, my daughter. <laughs> About two hours later, there they were uh, walking around together and she eventually brought him up to our suite and said, Dad, this is Hayden. And I said, I know. And now they've got two children. 
they should have gotten married at the road rally. Richard Carr, where have you been? I haven't seen your name in the chat room in a while. Have you been hiding out? So submissions are not anonymous. No, they see the name um, and they see the song title. But what they don't see, somebody just asked yesterday on the forum or so, somebody just asked me recently, um, can the screeners see the history to see if something was forwarded before? No, they have no idea. They have no idea what anybody else is listening to. They can't look at any history, none of that stuff. That's right, 2,500 people showed up at my wedding and they flew in from all over the globe. I think it would be so cool. You know, I would actually get myself ordained from the back of like Boy's Life magazine or something uh, and become a minister so I could perform uh, the ceremony. Deb and I have actually repeated our vows. Here's what a romantic guy I am. And you know, I don't think she really understood how awesome I am at the time. Uh, for our 10th anniversary, I remarried my wife with a surprise wedding in front of about 100 close friends um, and, and some family members. My parents actually came to town and uh, I told my wife, I said, wear something nice. We're going out to a fancy restaurant tonight. And our kids were, gosh, I don't know, I don't know, like, you know, five and eight or something at the time. And uh, so all by myself from my laptop here in my office, I put together a guest list. I sent out email, email invitations and we were going out to dinner at like four in the afternoon on a Sunday. And I went, oh, shoot, I've got to run over to XYZ restaurant to drop off, you know, somebody's keys or whatever. I forgot to do it yesterday. It'll only take a minute. We pull in the parking lot and my wife sees a ton of people standing out there. She goes, what, what's going on? And actually had a chuppah um, and a rabbi and uh, everything. I mean, it was a, a full on legit wedding and that's what I did for our 10th anniversary. And believe it or not, that was almost 20 years ago. So there you go, guys. That's the new standard. If you wanna impress your wife, um, Doreen did the remarry thing too got divorced after 44 years of marriage now we didn't get divorced and then remarry each other we just did a re-wedding um, I, I was divorced from my first wife but um, thank you Marianne <laughs> A Dudist priest. I married my manager and his wife a couple of years ago. Well, I hope you get a discount. I hope he's working for you for 15% instead of 20 then. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Ken Mesford remarried music. That's cute. You're glad your wife doesn't watch this? I've got your home address, JD. I can send her a note. <laughs> I think that was the subject line in the email I sent out, is join the Lascos for a re-wedding. Don't tell Deb it's a secret. Um, yeah, she, she literally had no idea. I mean, I had flowers, um, the whole deal. Uh, it was pretty cool. <laughs> Robbie Hancock had to stop cooking, come over and join the chat, tell me that is an awesome story. You must have been so nervous. I wasn't nervous in the least, Robbie. Um, uh, you know, honestly, and I don't mean to say that sounding like an egomaniacal a-hole, 
but because of my road rally experience, it was a piece of cake putting it together. Honestly, it was pretty easy. <laughs> I mean, all I had to do, I, I called our synagogue and most of our friends happened to go to that, a lot of our friends, probably like 80% of them that live in our area also go to that synagogue. So I called our rabbi and told him what I was doing and I said, can you share the email addresses of these people? And he knew that I knew them all well, so it wasn't like he was you know, doing something uh, unseemly by giving me their email addresses, many of which I had anyway. Um, I, I can't think of any aspect of it that was hard. And you know, look, when there's free food involved, people will show up, free food and booze. And, and, and we did it in a parking lot. There was actually a restaurant, uh, and so we did the ceremony in the parking lot, and then I just basically booked, it's a, a small little restaurant with probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 seats in it. So we just kind of booked the whole thing, including the parking lot, and everybody showed up, had a great time. We tied all those, you know, I almost had the, the taxi, taxi, there, uh, you know, with the just married sign. But frankly, I was worried about my parents driving my car home. <laughs> so I didn't do it. Ooh, Gibson SG reissue. Nice. Andre just woke up. He heard free food. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, uh, and here's the thing is we keep kosher at home. You know, we don't mix meat and milk. We have two separate dishwashers, a double-sided sink, all that stuff. So I had to do it at a kosher restaurant. Luck and there aren't a whole lot of kosher restaurants where we live. Uh, so luckily the, the kosher restaurant is like half a mile from our house. Um, it was fun. Yeah, um, for our 20th anniversary, Deb and I went to Santa Barbara for a romantic little getaway, uh, left the kids at home. I think at that point they were teenagers anyway, so they probably had a giant party while we were gone. And we went to, I forget, but some fancy expensive like four or $500 a night hotel for an overnighter in Santa Barbara. And that night we went out to a sushi restaurant, I believe, that was on the other side of like the main drag, whatever the coast highway is called up there. And uh, so we go over, we cross over, we have this really nice, very sweet, romantic dinner, amazing food. And afterwards, we're walking around whatever resort was on the other, that side of, of the little highway or street, whatever. And uh, we're outside by a pool area looking out at the ocean. And I was saying something to Deb and I turned around to walk the other way. There was a half inch thick plate, piece of plate glass that was sitting there. And I did a full face plant in the glass and just like buckled. And she laughed her ass off. Seriously, it's amazing I didn't break my nose. It's amazing I didn't knock out any teeth and it's amazing I didn't get a concussion. I mean, I walked right into it. Yes, I might've had a drink in me. Now you know why I don't drink much. I mean, I creamed my face in this half inch piece of glass. If she's watching this episode at home, which I doubt, or if she were sitting here with me now, she would be laughing her butt off because she thinks that's the funniest thing in the world. If I got hit by a car, she would think that was hysterical. Speaking of getting hit by a car, I will close out today's fascinating episode. Um, boy, I've really perked up, haven't I? Thank you, Trader Joe's. Um, I was here, did I mention this on the show? I don't think so, yesterday. Saturday, I was here till about eight o'clock. Um, and I left the office and got on the 101 freeway, which is like half a block or so from the office. And it's a very long, more or less uphill on-ramp. And did I floor it? Yeah, was I doing 80 miles an hour by the time I got well onto the freeway? Yes, I was. And then you go over a hill and there's freeway kind of down the hill. None of these are like that kind of hill. It's more like that kind of hill. Anyway, as soon as I crested the hill, everything in front of me stopped. And I mean, I've never seen a hundred cars stop so short in my life. And my car stopped just inches away from the car in front of me. 
And honestly, um, I instantly had two thoughts. Thank God and thank you, manufacturer of my car. I literally thought that. And then I looked at my rear view and I thought, that's it. I'm a dead man. I'm going to get creamed because I see 100 cars behind me all doing 80 miles an hour getting ready to cream me. Not one car skidded or lost control. It was the most amazing thing to watch. And what happened was in front of me, maybe, I don't know, a few hundred feet in front of me, all of a sudden there was this flash of light, this orange flash of light, and this giant cloud, like some sort of miniature nuclear holocaust just happened. Um, and then we were stuck. Did I show you this the other day? I can't remember if I did or I didn't. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Okay, let's see if I can freeze frame this. Mm, pretty hard to see it, actually. Anyway, hard to see, but okay, so what it was, was there was a big pickup truck that was perpendicular to the lanes of the traffic on, one, on the 101, and the whole side of it is just all smashed in, and there's like a whole bunch of like chicken wire, chain link, chain link fence bunched up by its tires, and the truck was like 18 inches to two feet off the chassis, like it had rolled and tried to rip itself off the chassis, and... So I found out yesterday, Liz, who Liz, you know, who's working on the show right now, said, oh yeah, I heard about that. What happened was the guy was on a side road that parallels the freeway, and it's up on a hill. And people do tend to speed on that road, and he lost control and went barreling down the hill onto a freeway perpendicular to five lanes of traffic. He had to be doing 60, 70 miles an hour up there to lose control on that road, come barreling down. And he got all the, yes, our Liz, he got all the way across all these lanes of traffic and hit the divider wall. Um, here, I'm going to try and play this video. I don't know if this is going to translate. There you go. That's exciting, right? I'll do it one more time, give you the full effect. How that guy made it across multiple lanes of the freeway, um, I will never know. I missed something. What what happened, Simon? Ooh, friend of yours was hit by a car and died. I am sorry to hear that. Man, oh man. That's like, you know, nah, I don't even say it. No matter what you say in those situations, it seems inappropriate, but I'm really sorry to hear that. Wow, Greg, you saw a coyote this morning. My brother. Wow. Well, anyway, um, I'm sorry to hear about your friend, and I'm um, on the flip side of that. Uh, thank God. I mean, that truck, how do you make it across five lanes of traffic driving perpendicular to the traffic? How did that guy not T bone anybody in the first lane or two? And how did nobody T bone him? And how did he make it all the way over to the center divider across five lanes? Five lanes. I don't know. And, and it was quite a bit of traffic, you know. I mean, it, it wasn't like bumper to bumper, but it was a lot of traffic. Anyway, um, it was miraculous. Uh, 
who was your toughest to deal with client that you ever recorded? Um, frankly, they were all pretty easy to work with. There were moments, but the vast majority of them were quite normal, uh, just like us hanging out. It's not like, oh my gosh, you're Eric Clapton, you're a rock star. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of that. Uh, especially when we were in the confines of the studio, there was none of it. There was professionalism, like we were there to make their life easy, productive, and creative. Um, but it was more like a family, like we've got here. Um, yeah, it wasn't like you. a lot of people would think it would be. Anyway, all right, I am going to leave work early today because I've just been dragging my butt around all day. Thank you for joining me. Um, <laughs> how do you become a session guitarist for when you start your Michael Lasko recording project uh, and will there be cowbell um, you could just be invited because you're so damn incredibly awesome um, you know who else I've always thought that I would love to get you and Richard, what's his name, Crawdaddy. Um, the two of you guys would be like Clapton and um, oh, uh, Dwayne Allman, um, just trading licks. It'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Um, so there you go. Uh, see you on Thursday, right back here, 4 o'clock. Don't forget to give us a like, please. Um, it's amazing that we've been doing the quarantinis for a year now, a little slightly over a year, and we still get on average about 60 people watching the live show and two or 300 people in total looking at the episodes. Um, and we still get like the same. So give us some likes, right? Um, would really appreciate that. And also don't forget to drop some ideas for what we could talk about in the comment section, what we can talk about Thursday. That It takes a lot of pressure off me if I don't have to come up with subjects. Otherwise, I'm just sitting here going, bleh, 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 and I don't like to do that. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. See you soon. Thanks for showing up. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye -bye. There's Keith LeBrant now.